Today we're continuing our discussion of the interwar period, a period very rich in artistic movements in isms. The world had less than 20 years to recover from the First World War before the Spanish Civil War reignited a conflict that would morph into World War II. That's not a lot of time in terms of this course, but it does represent a whole lot of art. I was very impressed at how Michael Wood's Art of the Western World series managed to pack a lot of information and images into a half hour video, so I'm going to let him do much of my work for me. Fasten your seatbelts. By the way, Sister Wendy does the same thing in a more engaging, if less scholarly, fashion. I've encouraged Ms. Jacobs to try to create an extra credit lunchtime video opportunity uh, to see her take on this tumultuous period. I'm going to start with one impulse that emerged from World War I and perhaps even more from the Russian Revolution that the war helped ignite, a drive to create a utopia, a new, better world from the ruins of the old. Many Russian artists embraced avant-garde art for the same reason that Italian painters launched futurism. They despised their country's past and they wanted to see their society and its art modernized and transformed. Suprematism was a Russian avant-garde movement that celebrated the supremacy of pure feeling, that is, that celebrated pure abstraction. Its most famous proponent was Kasimir Malevich. These two pro-Soviet propaganda posters both show the influence of Malevich and suprematism. But once the Russian Civil War was over, communist leaders called for art that would more clearly serve the revolution and help build a new society. And Russian artists answered that call. Here's a video clip describing the Soviet artist's response, an artistic movement known as constructivism. By the way, almost every AP test I've ever seen has at least one question about Russian constructivism. So here are two constructive constructivist works, excuse me, including the model for the tower you just saw in the video. Eventually, the communist leadership soured even on constructivist art. Stalin, like Hitler, had no patience for abstraction. And in 1932, he decreed that socialist realism, naturalistic art that celebrated the worker, was the only acceptable art form. Here's a famous example. Meanwhile, German artists protest the horrors of war and the incompetence of Germany's post-war government. Here's a very short clip about George Gross. And here's another painting by Gross on a similar theme, Fat Cat Capitalist and the Corruption of the Weimar Government. This brutal painting likewise captures the horrors of war and of state-sponsored violence. These were all, by the way, painters very much of the left. Away from the maelstrom of revolutionary Russia and post-war Germany, utopian visions often took on a more abstract utopian cast. Two examples of this are the organic sculpture of Brancusi and others, and the geometric paintings, uh, most notably by Mondrian. Both artists sought a more rational, more humane new order. You need to know this sculpture, by the way. It represents a very important move toward abstract sculpture. So here's another clip from the video. These are examples of organic sculpture by a British woman sculptor. And here is a sculpture by another famous organic sculptor, Henry Moore. Note that both the Moore and the Hepworth sculptures not only celebrate the shapes of nature, but also draw attention to holes or voids, uh, or what we've been calling negative space. Moore's sculpture also deliberately evokes pre-Columbian Mexican figures. Again, a very important element of art in this period uh, is how much it draws on the influence of non-Western art that basically European imperialism had brought to the attention of European artists. The video doesn't include this label for the movement that Mondrian led, but you need to know it. The AP exam will almost certainly ask you about it, and you'll be hearing a presentation about it. So I've included this explanation in your notes so that you don't have to copy it all down. I was a little surprised to find this image in this chapter, note the date, but it is true that Calder's moving sculptures or mobiles were heavily influenced both by Mondrian's paintings and by early 20th century preoccupation with depicting movement and the relationship between time and space. There's also an obvious kinship with the organic sculptures. But de Stille's greatest impact actually came in the field of architecture, and this is actually where you're most likely to be asked questions. Here is a distill house constructed in the Netherlands. Note the assemblage of geometric shapes. 
Rietveld also designed furniture for his open plan houses. Looks a bit like a furniture version of a Mondrian painting, doesn't it? The distilled emphasis on incorporating art into living environments was adopted and further developed by a famous architectural movement of the 1920s, inaugurated by the Bauhaus School, founded by Walter Grobius. I should note, by the way, as the video does, that they were also heavily influenced by Russian constructivism. And again, this kind of utopian ideal of creating a more livable society for ordinary people. As always, I think architecture is more easily seen on video than a slide, so here is still another clip. And here are some images that you just saw in the video. This house is a must-know work. I hope you took notes from the video. You do need to know this architect as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Gropius was succeeded as leader of the Bauhaus by Mies van der Rohe, who moved the Bauhaus to Germany and further Bauhaus School to, to Berlin, excuse me, and further developed what came to be known as the international style. When the Nazis closed down the Bauhaus School, which was a hotbed of what Hitler called degenerate art, van der Rohe moved to Chicago and greatly influenced the direction of post-war American architecture. Many of the glass and steel boxes that define the American urban skyline were designed or inspired by Mies van der Rohe. In America, before the Mies van der Rohe invasion, architectural innovation took what, in my personal opinion, was a rather more engaging turn. And this is another architect that you do need to know. I talked about organic sculpture. Frank Lloyd Wright was the master of organic architecture. That is, architecture closely integrated with its natural environment. Wright was a Chicago architect, and his low-slung buildings were designed to reflect the Midwest's Great Plains, hence the name Prairie Style. This is the Roby House, which is now part of the University of Chicago. Let's return to our video for a closer look at this and other works by Frank Lloyd Wright. Again, another AP favorite. Here are the stained glass windows designed for the Roby House. You'll note the influence both of Distill and of Art Deco. Like Gerard Rietfeld of the Distill School, Frank Lloyd Wright designed furniture to go with his homes. In fact, many of these architects designed furniture, again, it was part of their vision of creating a workable, functional living space. This may be Frank Lloyd Wright's most famous building, and again, it's a college board favorite. Falling Water was designed to fit into its woodland setting. The balconies were made of reinforced concrete that was cantilevered over the water. Cantilevered is a term you need to know. Unfortunately, Wright's design was not as architecturally sound as it was architecturally interesting. It cost $155,000 to build this house in 1939, which was a lot of money back then. It took $11.5 million to restore it in 1994. The balconies were sagging and they had to be lifted back in place with steel cables. We don't have time to watch it, alas, but the link takes you to a very interesting four-minute video that uses computer graphics to show how this house was constructed and designed to tie into its natural environment. It's on Moodle, so check it out. Here's a Unitarian church that Wright designed in Oak Park, Illinois. It's shown up on past AP tests, which is why I'm including it. Frank Lloyd Wright's style is so distinctive you could easily get a question about one of his buildings that you haven't seen before. Uh, here's a glimpse of the interior. Again, you note the organic shapes, uh, but I mean, excuse me, the geometric shapes, but the more organic design. Let me close this speedy trip through modernist architecture with a bit of a detour. Not everybody liked the stark, unembellished international style. Frank Lloyd Wright was partly responding to that, but Art Deco also rose in response, a kind of marriage of Lewis Sullivan's sleek form follows function, architectural style with the arts and crafts and Art Nouveau decorative impulses. So let's watch one last video clip, and I'll make a confession. I love Art Deco. It may have been retro, even at the time, but I think it's worn better than the concrete steel and glass boxes it rebelled against. Postmodern architects mostly agree, as we'll see in our final chapter. The building you just saw in the video was the Rockefeller Center, and we'll get a peek inside later. But here is a close-up of the Art Deco spire of the Chrysler Building. And now we leave the world of utopia for the world of weird visions, economic disaster, and approaching war.